are listening to what the public want. They are few and we are many. If you keep coming back, at some point you will make the change. Something began on that day that cannot be reversed. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Today on the show, a huge day of protest, but a relatively unknown story is captured in the film We Are Many. We talk to the filmmaker and Phyllis Bennis. We also talk about what it takes to make change in the world today. All that and one of my commentaries coming up. February 15, 2003, saw millions of people in the streets in 800 cities on seven continents. It was a huge day of protests to stop an impending war on Iraq. And yet the story is not well understood. A new documentary is just out, We Are Many, that takes a look at that day of protest, what went into it, and its legacy. Here to talk about the film and the movements, is Amir Amirani, a longtime filmmaker for the BBC, and Phyllis Bennis, a fellow with the Institute for Policy Studies and an author of, among other things, Challenging Empire. Welcome to the program. So glad to have you. Good to Thank be you. here. Let's start by taking a look at the trailer from We Are Men. This is a battle with only one outcome. Our victory, not theirs. The institutions of the British state had set out to tell lies. We can stop this war. Virtually everybody I know was on it. The whole of my family went on it. It was the biggest demonstration coordinated in the history of the whole earth. Amen beautiful movement that's gonna stop them from dropping those bombs. It was off the hook. They started in the South Pacific. It was Australia, it was Sydney. North Asia, South Asia. Malaysia, Philippines, it was India. Russia, Africa, across into Europe. And then finally, it came to New York. People for blots and blots. We're starting something really big. Not in our name. Not in our name. You know, size of protest is like deciding, well, I'm going to decide policy based upon a focus group. This bastard is actually going to take us to war. Easy the American people do not want this! It was over. Hey, back up! Back up! Back up! These were lies. I'm giving them back. Injustice doesn't go away, it will come out. Blood will have blood. The demonstrations did not stop after the invasion of Iraq, they went on. That spring of 2003 was really the beginning of the democracy movement. That's when hell broke loose in Egypt. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. The first thing people of my generation say is we live to see it. That this revolution has been in the making for at least 10 years. The people will be heard! They are listening to what the public want. They are few and we are many. If you keep coming back, at some point you will make the change. Something began on that day that cannot be reversed. The movie really takes you back, of course. Um, Phyllis, I know you were in the streets in New York, as was I. Well, let's start with you, Amir. Where, where were you? I was in Berlin. I had been to the Berlin Film Festival. Uh, it was the first year of something they called the Talent Campus, and I'd been making a little film there. I was aware the demonstration was sort of coming, and, and I was thinking, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to stay in Berlin or go back to London? I'll stay in Berlin. Now, were you a veteran protester at this point? Not at all. This was going to be my first protest, my first political act. And so I was aware that this thing was brewing. I stayed in Berlin. It was big, 
half a million people. I, it was really energizing. I went back to London and my friend said, you missed an amazing day. I said, but it was huge in Berlin, half a million people. They said, no, you have no idea. Two million people in, in London. And I felt really upset that I'd missed this amazing day in my city. And it bugged me. And I kept thinking about it. And I thought, so let me see. It happened in Berlin, happened in London. Where else did it happen? And that was the start. Mm. And I researched it. And at some point, I had a light bulb moment thinking, wait a minute. This was huge, probably the biggest demonstration in history. There's a story here. <laughs> I'm just curious. It, it was a huge demonstration, as we know. And it was the first global demonstration. Yes. And it was the first of a few other things. But I'm curious why you, it, if you hadn't protested before, why did you feel compelled to go to that one? What was different about it? Because I suppose, <clears throat> although I hadn't been on a demonstration before, I was a political, you know, minded, politically minded person. It's a very interesting question, why on that one? And I suppose it's uh, not a coincidence that millions of people right. around the world, it was their first time. There yeah, was something exactly. about the atmosphere that was created. Uh, somehow it had crept into public consciousness on a, in a way that hadn't happened before that I hadn't been aware of. So, um, so I thought, you know, you have to go on this thing because maybe because mm -hmm. it was patently obvious to anyone that this was a fraud being perpetrated yeah. on everyone. Yeah. Um, and I think that was probably what drove many people in so. the streets. There was also this sense that we could stop something before it started. Instead Which is also of protesting a war already underway, there was a chance that we could stop it, right? There was. And I think that we felt some of that backstage. And I was backstage because I was speaking at the protest. I ended up speaking twice, actually, which was sort of amazing. The speakers had 60 seconds, which you can't really say anything in 60 seconds, but there was literally someone 30 feet out in this enormous crowd with a giant sign that started with, actually, no, it was 90 seconds, not 60, and it would be 90, then suddenly 60, 30, end. And you had just a moment to say two sentences, mm -hmm. you know. But I think that there was a sense backstage, as you say, Laura, that we really might be able to do this, which you don't feel very often with protests, a lot because we're protesting something that's already underway. But this one, there was a sense, it was very emotional. People were crying all over the place, you know? It was the coldest day of the year, and everyone was freezing. And you couldn't see faces, everyone was too wrapped up, you know, in layers and layers of, in New York, right? Of course, in Australia, it was a hot summer day. But there was a sense of, emotion and connection that this time might be different. Mm. This time maybe we can pull it off. And I remember I spoke the first time about sort of the nature of global protest and why that was important. And then about midway through, someone got a call on their cell phone. I don't remember who it was. Somebody, because of course by that time, nobody, not too many people had cell phones, but somebody did. Somebody called in that a report had just come in over the AP wire. And it was just two sentences, just two lines. And they scrawled it on the back of the leaflet and came running over to a few of us and said, look what just came over the AP. Should we say something? And what it said was, stung by the outpouring of global criticism, the US and Britain have just announced that they will not try to use the original resolution as the basis for war. It was huge. And we talked about it. What if it's not true? What if they change their mind? Referring to the earlier Referring UN to the, resolution. Exactly. And we didn't know. And then finally, a couple of us said, look, people should know this. People should know why this is important. And I remember Leslie Kagan turned to me, and she was the MC at the moment, had been one of the main organizers of the protest. She looked at me, she said, well, Phyllis, you're our UN person. I had been at the UN that morning meeting with Kofi Annan. She said, you've got to read it to people. So she pushed me back out on stage for the second time. Yeah. And all I said was, anybody here who thinks that what we do here today doesn't matter, listen up. I still want to talk about this idea of the other superpower, which Patrick mm -hmm. Tyler wrote about in the New York Times. It's mentioned in your, in your film. You've picked up on it, Phyllis. It was almost the title for your <laughs> wonderful book, Challenging Empire, I know. And yet, even in the film, Leslie Kagan, one of the organizers who'd been organizing demonstrations like this for decades, says we were not strong enough. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't help but think, we're still not strong enough. And saying there's a power doesn't make it powerful doesn't make it a, doesn't make it true and where do you know where do you see power to do 
change, to force change, to make policy be different? I think that we have enormous power. We don't yet have the power that we need. Mm -hmm. You know, in the Cold War, there were two superpowers. They weren't equal. You know, the U.S. still dominated, and it ultimately won the war. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean the Soviet Union was not a superpower that was contending with U.S. power. Patrick Tyler's piece, I think, was important partly because he identified the significance of global public opinion. Mm -hmm. But I always thought also that what made it a, quote, superpower was that that mobilization of social movements, of civil society around the world, was powerful enough to push governments. So we had what became known as the uncommitted six in the Security Council. These were six small, weak countries that could never alone go head to head with the U.S. They would collapse in a minute because the U.S. was putting down pretty significant threats against them. Chile, Angola, Pakistan, Cameroon, Guinea, I'm forgetting one more, Mexico. Um, all of these are countries that depend on the United States. Yeah. Every one of them said no. And the reason they were able to was that they, their own capitals were flooded with people demanding that they say no. Because people were challenging not only what the U.S. was doing, but their own government's collaboration with it. So the biggest protests were in London, Madrid, Barcelona, the places where the governments were allying themselves with the U.S. Yeah. against popular will. So this notion of it being a superpower doesn't mean that you always win. You know, our democracy in this country is so flawed, so under the control of corporate interests and big money, that public opinion means very little these days. That doesn't mean that it's not the necessary first step. There are people I'm sure watching this who are pulling their hair out about what's happening now. Yeah. Not just in Syria, not just in Iraq, in Afghanistan, studio. Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, Somalia, you name it. Mm. This was all very good, this demonstration that was organized. People knew where to be on February 15, 2003. Where do they need to be now, Phyllis? This is a really hard moment. The powerful elite forces in the government, picked up by the media in this country, the corporate media, have used the politics of fear very, very powerfully. So what people need to do is all the old tactics still have to be employed. Right now, Congress is out of session. People need to be meeting, demanding meetings on a daily basis with their member of Congress. Members of Congress are on the campaign trail. They need to be bird dogged. That means you go after them, you follow them at every event, and you demand to know, Congresswoman, where do you stand on using military force against Syria? How do you justify it? Get it on record. They will be coming back. Right now, it's a big issue whether Congress will even take its constitutional responsibility to vote on this. We have to be demanding that Congress not allow the president to just do whatever the hell he wants with his, with his generals. Some people will also be moving in the streets. That's important. None of these things are going to stop this war. You know, it's sort of the same thing when people say, if you don't support war against ISIS, what, what are you going to do today when people get killed? Mm. There isn't always an immediate response that's going to work. All of the things I and others have been talking about as the alternatives to war that have to do with diplomacy, humanitarian aid, new negotiations, et cetera, et cetera, none of those are going to solve the problem tomorrow. None of those are going to solve the problem of Kobani. All of this work around Congress, all of that, none of that is going to stop this war tomorrow. Mm. But we have to do it all. And we have to be a pressure point that they can no longer ignore. I mean, and actually on that, that's, a, that's an interesting point because actually the, the, the shadow of <clears throat> that demonstration hangs heavy on the British Parliament. The shadow of the war hangs heavy in the sense that there was a vote to go to war. That is now, there's no turning back from that. It is now accepted in Britain that you cannot go to war without taking a vote in Parliament. That's an achievement. Yeah, absolutely. And they were at pains to point out in the British Parliament that um, the Iraqi government invited, invited them, that there will be no boots on the ground, that should there be discussion of going into Syria, that that will have to be put to, to a vote. These are interesting mm. sort of dif differentiating kind of... Um, that gives us an opportunity. To, factors to challenge and interestingly when that vote in on Syria was defeated the, and it, there's a bit in the film where the Minister of Defense did a little study they were so shocked by it 
uh, that they said actually this MPs were swayed by public opinion and their analysis this paper said that there's been a sh structural shift in the public mm. against war. Will people be able to see your film around the States anytime soon? We are hoping to bring it to the States in 2015, in maybe in the summer, and do a um, cinema release. Um, and we're working on that and now trying to you know, talk to distributors and cinemas and so on. So I very much want it to be seen as widely as possible in America. And let's hope it sparks lots more of these kinds of conversations. Thank you both. Phyllis Benes, Amir Amirani. Thank you, you can find out Thank more you. about We Are Many at our website. Okay, let's read it. Everybody, that's what he said. Read it. Right off the top. I can only hope now that our work has just begun, which is to use this moment that we have here as a beachhead up for an uprising all across this nation to stop extreme fossil fuel extraction and replace it with renewable energy. This has to happen. It's our life's work now to dismantle the oil and gas industry piece by piece. And so our work with Crestwood continues, and it continues now um, with even more effort and even with more attention because we don't have to have our eye on the whole fracking battle for New York State. Having won that battle now, our, all of our energy and effort and our blood and our passion are going to be here. Because remember, that gas is coming from Pennsylvania and other places where they're still fracking. So we don't want to aid and abet that. All of the data that we've compiled here, the narrative that we've created here based on that evidence now has to be turned to the rest of the states. But happily, New York leads. That's why I'm proud to be a New Yorker today. We're going to lead this nation in showing how we can become a showcase for renewable energy. And, and, and the governor said it right this, today, that nobody really wants fracking. It's just that there's no other economic development. Yeah, we did it. And it took oh, the entire state working together and people taking out second mortgages on their homes and, come, and delaying their retirement. and choosing not to have families at all and giving up opportunities because they're all fighting for life itself and for air and for water, which is life. And it's just been an honor to be part of this movement and to be able to say that we've had this victory. We shall not, we shall not be moved. Everybody now. We
riding therapy thing. I keep my horse on the east side of Seneca. <laughs> it's the same shirt my wife wore to get arrested. Yes. Okay. I don't move our parade here too much. This guy makes you make that Yeah, come on, right here. spent two very different weekends in the company of two very different groups of people dealing with two very related problems. On the one hand, invasive warrantless wiretapping, on the other, violent unwarranted policing. The first gathering was dominated by white people, hackers, journalists and artists concerned about surveillance, secrecy and censorship. Their stories were hair-raising, tracked cell phones, data-driven drone strikes, imprisoned whistleblowers and all the rest. Later, with the Millions March in New York City, the demographics were very different. Predominantly African-American, the triggers there were police brutality and killings in communities of color, as well as official impunity in the slaughter of, among others, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, seven-year-old Ayanna Stanley Jones, and 12-year-old Tamir Rice. The list just keeps growing. The two groups and the two events differed, but they put me in mind of a single story, the one about feeling the elephant. You know the one. In the story, a group of people who can't see very well are trying to learn what an elephant looks like by touching it, but each is feeling a different part of the animal. So is the monstrous creature mostly tusk or tummy or overwhelmingly trunk? Compiling the big picture is no simple matter until the touches start comparing notes when it all comes together. Depending on who is doing the touching today, our monster feels like drones and wiretaps or guns and chokeholds. But can we agree we're touching parts of the same elephant? It's not affecting all of us the same or all of us equally or with the same result, but it's one big problem, isn't it? From our government's urge to control global communications and punish dissent, to our beat cops' demand for total obedience, too many of us are being too policed too brutally with too little accountability to grievous effect on our shared body politic. Coming together could make us smarter quicker. In just one example, in an interview with The Nation magazine, NSA leaker Edward Snowden asked recently, the question is, particularly in the post-9-11 era, are societies becoming more liberal or more authoritarian? Frontline communities of color could have answered that question right quick, and they might have suggested that 9-11 doesn't have much to do with it. Drones or chokeholds? Our elephant is rampant policing. Now, if only all those who've been feeling it, tusk and trunk, could feel their way towards one another and make common cause to tame it. Write to me. Tell me what you think. Laura at GritTV.org. And thank you. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders in Caracas, Venezuela, where one of the big questions is, who owns what? Nosotros creemos aquí los jóvenes que una revolución es posible en los Estados Unidos, por eso mi mensaje es a todos los jóvenes estadounidenses que sigan movilizándose, que sigan luchando. The Magna Carta established the rights of the commons, 
Our next guest is the historian on this topic. I think human happiness ended at a certain point with the birth of capitalism. You know, ISIS, the Islamic State, is very much the child of war. It's something that grew up in war, that it uh, flourished in war. Um, so, and they didn't think that war would spread.